everyone. Welcome to the ID Show at Stanford University. Today we're going to be talking about the Trevor Noah controversy, tiny homes, and female role models. Let's get started. Our first topic today is concerning Trevor Noah and his comment about the World Cup. That he said that Africa was the winner of the World Cup, and that's drawing criticism even from French ambassador Gerard Arred, who released a letter on Twitter claiming that Noah was stripping these uh, players of their Frenchness. We're going to see if that argument holds any weight and touch base with our panelists. Okay, what do you think, guys? All right, so basically, I agree with Trevor Noah's outlook on the whole situation because I don't feel like you can take something away from someone that's so evident. Because if you look at the, the French team, uh, a lot of them are African. And exactly. And you can't, you can't just negate the fact that they are African even though they play for the French national team. Yes. And I feel like Trevor Noah's comment on duality holds so much weight because it's part of what makes them who they are, yeah. being French and being African. African. So you can't take one of the two away from them because yeah. it's part of what makes them who they are. And uh, I also agree with the sentiments about um, how, you know, French people of uh, African descent are, are generally treated in, mm. in, in uh, France by, by Nazis. Um, I feel like it, you don't need to be, uh, you know, uh, someone special. You don't need to be a celebrity. You don't need to have won a World Cup for you to be recognized as mm -hmm. French. Everyone should get the same level of respect, uh, you know, just as as a person, really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's my view of the situation. I'm I'm in full support of Trevor Noah's, um, you know, sentiments on duality. Excellent. Yeah, what about the rest of you? But um, what I have to say is that <clears throat> although when Trevor made the joke comment, um, the ambassador fell. Yes, you know, the fell, French ambassador. You know, Almost and I was just thinking to myself, well, why do you feel offended that he did not mention? We all saw that they were from, uh, they played for France, so obviously they're from France, so why can't we recognize the fact that they're also from Africa? Right. So, and to be honest, if we have to do like a survey or something, most of the people that supported France during the World Cup, I mean, we all have our individual teams. And as our teams went out, you had to choose one to support for the finals. And I bet you that most of the Africans supported France because of the amount of the players that are actually from Africa. Right. And I'm one of those. I supported them because <laughs> almost 80% of the team was from Africa. Yeah, so exactly. I see nothing wrong with the co uh, joke, comment that yeah. um, Trevor made. How many were actually born in Africa, though? <clears throat> I think the actual only stat was only two only two of 23 only were two. actually born in Africa. Do you think they still associate with or would relate to being African? I mean, I mean they were you, born and raised in, in France. You can be born and raised in a place, but that doesn't change who you are. Yeah, it doesn't take away the part of you that is, for example, in this case, African. Like, I'm half Thai, half Danish, but I'm not less of any nationality even though I wasn't born in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So like the African players, even though they're not born in Africa, that doesn't make them less African. Do you cheer for Denmark? I cheer for both, but Thailand didn't make it into the <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I cheer for Denmark. Yeah, like I'm from Canada, and Canada is definitely like a melting pot. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people there that would sit there and they'd look at me and they, they would maybe say, oh, typical Canadian. But if you went up to someone who was Asian, and then just assumed that they were Chinese, yeah. they would get offended. Sure. If they sat there and then, oh, there's an Asian person who won the World Cup, or you know, won, you know, the, the Stanley Cup, it wouldn't be like all China would be yeah. cheering because that person looks similar to them. Um, in Canada, Chinese people were used as slaves for the for the uh, for the railway hundreds of years ago, way before my family ever got there. Yeah. Right, so. That just because someone looks a certain way, I'm not sure it necessarily equates to how they self-identify. 
Well, the argument, I think, from... So Gerard Arad is the name of the person who was uh, the French ambassador that wrote the Twitter yeah. letter to, to Noah, to Trevor Noah. Noah. And his points, among many that he made, was that it... it this is a direct quote from Arad. He said it leg, uh, Noah's comment legitimized the ideology which claims whiteness as the only definition of being French. So I guess in France, they have a problem, of course, with um, like Nazi groups and also like the old right trying to say that African migrants are not, who are French citizens are not French. Mm -hmm. And so I guess our argument is that by Trevor Noah saying that it legitimizes the, that, that notion of those mm -hmm. people who are already saying, do you think that that has any weight or because I think Noah's point was that, okay, but it depends on the context. Like, I'm an African-American person who's saying it to other Africans yeah. who, who are also migrants in a different country. So I can say it to them because I'm just recognizing their Africanness the same as I can recognize my Africanness in America, America even though yeah. I'm an American citizen. So which do you agree with both of those points, or do you think one is more valid than the other? What, what is your feeling about them? I think in general, like, like Trevor, I usually agree with him. I think he's a great, he's a great talent. There's my disclaimer. But I think in this, in this case, he actually did step over a line. And where he stepped over the line was he sat there and he made a comment about their skin color hmm. and the French being a certain skin color. And that's where race got brought into it. It had nothing to do with nationality. It had to do more with race. And that's where he may have, may have opened up that door. And I assume you're talking about the part where he claimed that you can't go to the south of France and get a tan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not, you can't, yeah, you can't get that tan. Being, being south, south of France, France, France exactly. yeah. But the other thing that I also want to bring up is that um, not, to, uh, not only Trevor made that comment that Africa won the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So now I, I'm thinking is it because he was on a platform where um, everyone, because I mean, a lot of people watch. Yeah, the broad reach. Yeah. yeah. So now, is the ambassador going to say loud letters also to everyone that has mentioned that? Because <laughs> I mean, if you have to, during the World Cup, there were so many comments about Africa won the World Cup. Right. And I mean. From other Twitter users and people. Yeah, from everyone. Social media. From everyone. So. Why didn't they also mention the rest of you that are saying that Africa won the World Cup? Hmm. Why only Trevor? And why is that a popular sentiment? If it doesn't have some truth to it, yeah. why are people saying that? I think the Africans also, on top of it, also just proud the fact that there are people from Africa that have made it so far and yeah. they're playing for right. the yeah. World Cup and they actually won the World Cup so and I mean if we have to look in the um, history there is no African team that has actually made it that far and just to have that piece of Africa there just you know just gives you the pride and you also want to say like they are from us but they're also from France and so I, I really and just to add on to what Aina has been saying, um, I really feel like it's hard for a lot of Africans to uh, excel yeah. because sure. because of the lack of opportunities that are, you know, not present in Africa. So I feel like yeah, it makes us proud as Africans just to to identify with uh, with our own, um, you know, yeah. people yeah. of African descent yeah. doing great things. I mean, obviously. If you see people of your people from your own continent doing great things, you want to be in full support of that. Mm -hmm. They're showing the world what uh, Africa is capable of, of doing basically. It. And uh, yeah, I was just. And I'm, I'm not sure which player was it. I'm not sure if it's Pogba or Pepe, mm -hmm. but one of the two I read. Um, they wrote something about when they were younger, uh, one of their fathers wanted them to play football, but they couldn't because the team that they were supposed to play for wanted them to pay, and unfortunately they couldn't afford that, that mm -hmm. amount. But just look at them now. Is mm -hmm. that, or they didn't pay for it, but look where they are now. Mm -hmm. So for me that was just like, you know, the, they had, he had the opportunity, but he couldn't cause of lack of finances. But now look where he is. He's the one 
giving the prize to be uh, playing any song a team. Mm -hmm. So that was also just like. Mm. And I want to also bring up that Noah's response to the mm. uh, letter, which I think was interesting. So he said, when I'm saying African, I'm not saying it to exclude the players from their Frenchness. I'm saying it to include them in my Africanness. I will continue to call them African because they are of Africa. They can also be French because they can be both at the same time. If French people are saying that they can't be, then I think they have the problem and not me. Mm -hmm. So that brings up a different point about can people have a hyphenated identity mm -hmm. in, in this day and age? Is it more productive for people? Because in the US, and that was one thing that he said also, in America, people can celebrate their identity in mm -hmm. their Americanness. Mm -hmm. So we have like St. Patrick's Day, yes. which is a celebration of Irish immigrants. We have Juneteenth now, which is beginning to be more popular, mm -hmm. which is uh, celebrates the emancipation of the last remaining enslaved black people or African, uh, African slaves in uh, the uh -huh. US. So those are focusing on the history of migrant, like specific groups mm -hmm. that have migrated to the US and they're still American and that's not being taken away from them. But they also get to celebrate their other their identity of, from where they came from. So, and then I think France's approach is more of like trying to let everyone just no, uh, they are integrate into French culture completely. Like you're all integrated. We're not going to talk about oui. the difference. Yeah. Like that's my own opinion. Is that France is sort of saying like, okay, everyone's French. Don't don't get it twisted. We're all French. Like. And to me, it's like a little bit uh, tone deaf. Like, obviously, because another thing that a lot of the black players were saying on that team is that, like, when they scored a goal, I read this, when they scored a goal, oh, they're the French player. Yeah. But then when they, like, didn't do something or there, there was a story about that Noah actually brought up about this uh, African immigrant who was climbing this yes. building yes. to he save this child, child who was, was up there. And he was saying that, uh, when he, they had originally referred to him as an African migrant, and then when he came down from the uh, building with the child, then he, then they were like, oh, the French citizen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if they do something good, then so, they're the French citizen. Yeah. So but if they're being criticized, oh, well, that's the a the African migrants. It's so like, it's like a double standard. Yeah, they use it when they want. Yeah. They can yeah. Yeah. put yeah. friends yeah. out there. It's, France it's conditional. And, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's to like what if, extent? If, if, Sorry. To what extent are you considered French in this case? Whereas if you're not representing the country, why are you considered an immigrant? Because to me, it's dishonest to say, okay, like everyone's everyone's French, and there are no there are no differences because there are clearly differences, yeah. and there are differences in how people are treated. Yeah. Definitely. So to say that oh we're all French and and how dare America point out that 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 were different, I think, in my own opinion, is like a little bit tough. It's, it's human nature to want to be a part of something positive and to distance yourself from something negative. negative. So by using this semantics, we sort of distance ourselves from, you know, oh, that immigrant or, you know, versus that French person, right? right? I mean, in, in Canada, one of the things, like I said, it's, it's kind of a melting pot. Yeah. Um, we have 200,000 immigrants a year pouring to pour into Canada. We only have 36 million people. Yeah. So it makes up a very large percentage of, our, of, of people in Canada. So it's a very common question for me to ask you if I notice you have an accent to say where you're from. Mm. You know, I mean, we don't all assume that everybody's you know straight off the boat Canadian. You know, we don't assume that everybody's been there for generations on end. So even though in my family is two generations removed from from Holland, I still cheer for the salt for the Dutch uh, for the Dutch team in in, uh, in football. Right. I actually well said soccer <laughs> in football, but it's because I grew up in, with my grandparents sitting right. there and having Delft blue and yeah. you know wooden shoes and things like that yeah. when I was growing up. So yeah, it does sort of carry on and resonate from generation to generation. But let the players decide how they want to identify. They want to sit there and bring the statue back to the, the country that they were born or, or something, let them take care of that. Trevor Noah doesn't necessarily have to step up and, and uh, make this public statement about, about their Africanness. Let them do that. Mm -hmm. Anybody want the last word? Yeah. Um, I think Trevor Noah bringing this whole topic up was 
him voicing the opinion of many people. Yes, I think he, he definitely uses his platform for that specific purpose. And I feel like in this day and age, you can't put someone into a box. Mm. You can't say, okay, you're only French if you're of African descent. You get what I'm saying? We live in an era where people can be whoever they want to be. Mm -hmm. We're more liberal in our thinking, in our doing. I mean, look at, look at the um, LGBT movement. It started off as LGBT, then LGBTQ, LGBTQI. You get what I'm saying? People, people are becoming more free to express themselves. And I feel like you should continue to be free to express wherever you are and where you're from. You can't, you can't be put into one box. And um, what, like, so many of us at this university are from different nationalities, mm -hmm. are, are from different nations. And uh, we should all celebrate our diversity yeah. because there have been a lot of arguments that, uh, that uh, diversity is dying out because, you know, because of globalization and all of that. So I feel like you can't put people into a box and you should celebrate your, your diversity, your difference. The good that comes with it, the bad that comes with it. So you should, so just to sort of further that point, you're saying be more inclusive. Like, why can't everybody from Africa celebrate, you know, the World Cup being won by France based on where these people are from? You know, let's all be inclusive rather than with maybe this French ambassador trying to exclude yeah. a certain yeah. group of people. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think this whole uh, comment by Trevor Noah was a productive way to get people talking about it. Hmm. To, it was to, being a voice. Yeah, because now it. you know now we're talking about the topic, and I think a lot of people it really sparked the conversation internationally, obviously, yes. uh, about uh, what it means for to have multiple identities, what it means to be French, what it means to be African, a lot of different. Uh, topics can come out of what he said. So I think that proves that he, it, there was something to what he said and that people are like having different opinions about it. I think it's a good thing because it starts a conversation. Okay, sounds like a plan. We're on to the next topic. Each week, we poll the students here at Stanford University on uh, many different topics to see which ones you guys are more most interested in. And this week, we did the poll, and one of the most popular topics was whether or not women today uh, have positive female role models. So that's the next topic, and I want to hand it over to our hosts to see what they think. Okay, so... In terms of the younger generation, I feel like they don't really have individuals or female individuals to look up to as much as the, you know, our generation or older generations. In terms of how much social media has become such an impact, like for example, my, my brother, yeah, okay, he's the younger generation, but with his friends, they're always on Instagram and they're not really focused on the larger picture of what's happening around the world and who's really making an impact. Mm. And I think that it is a problem right now because it kind of shapes the values of what the younger generation is aiming to do with their life and how they want to make a change. Um, I feel that the younger generation of women, there are a lot of um, people they can look up to. You know, everything in life is a choice. So, yes, that the younger generation is really impacted by technology when it comes to, and social media and so forth. But when you go on social media, these people are there, but it's a choice we uh, decide to follow on social media, what we allow to get in. So for instance, I can be on social, I can have that platform and be on social media the whole time, but instead of going and following someone like uh, Michelle Obama or uh, Hillary Clinton, I go and I'd rather go follow Kylie Jenner. So I mean, it's all, I guess it's all about like what you're interested in now, right? Like the platform is like, oh, I'm also, interested in that's this. That's also the thing. We live in a society where this is not being brought up. Like, they don't talk about these women anymore. They talk about who has the next, uh, uh, who is the next billionaire yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Who this 
um, girl or whatever that is famous just released she, like a video of her having sex was just released out to the public and stuff like that instead of looking to the bigger picture like mm -hmm. Michelle Obama what does she do she loves children mm -hmm. most of her projects are children orientated but why is this not the uh, topic of conversation yeah I'm not saying that the younger generation doesn't have role models of yeah. course there are role models that they can look up to I'm just saying that, like you said, I agree with you that it's about choice, but I also think that the media kind of doesn't really shed light on the on people, the people that, that deserve yeah. the light. Exactly. Like, yeah, okay, Michelle Obama making a difference, you know, there's my role model, Malala Yousafzai. Yeah. She's also, she's young, she's and young. She's, she's making a difference, she's using her voice as something that can make a change to the world, but when you go on these types of platforms, it's not really being shown as much as things that are not as important like makeup lines or the thing now is that social media uh, like or social media the internet uh, anything else that can influence people they are shedding the light on not who's making a difference but who how can I say like they shed light on people who have an influence but not the positive influence mm -hmm. I want to say so, so when was the heyday for female role models? Like, there, has there ever been a time where you'd sit there and say that this was a point in time when females all had someone positive to look up to? Um, social media just sort of is just sort of putting a highlight on what we're already attracted to. You know, people who are interesting, people who are doing things, people who are releasing sex tapes or whatever the case may be. Right? That's never changed. But when it comes to actual role models. Like people for people to look up to and inspire them to empower them I think that's actually on the rise you've got a lot of people like JK Rowling you know when when did we ever have such a, a prominent voice female author as a voice in the world you got people like Gal, uh, Gal Galbit I mean Wonder Woman come on she actually shut down on the most powerful people in uh, in Hollywood you know Weinstein got him kicked off of the um, of, uh, being a producer for, for Wonder Woman um, you've got Emma Watson, who's very outspoken. You've got Rihanna, who's, who's very outspoken. We're starting to see the inner lives of these people a little bit more and what makes them tick, how they're handling day-to-day -day issues, you know, like Rihanna and with, with, uh, with, um, with abuse. And that's definitely, and I also think that it all depends on what you focus on. You can have this person that has so, um, they have, they're up to a lot of bad, or they're negative, is overshadowing the good in their life. And it's what you focus on. So what you focus on is what you're gonna, it's like a magnifying glass. So if you're gonna focus on it, it's gonna reflect. And it depends on what you focus. If you focus on the negative instead of the positive, that is gonna influence you. But if you take a, a Rihanna and you focus on the good or like what she's been through and you take that and you try and make the, uh, you try and make, look for the positive in it, it can actually have a positive uh, impact on you also instead of just looking at it and be like oh no she's a, a celebrity and celebrities are out to no good I'm not going to take her as a role model it's just you can have different people and just take the smallest positive thing from them put it together and you have your own role model that's how I look at it there's such a microscope on people nowadays too because of social media we're learning about more about their lives so they can't deny these things they how we get to see how they're handling it how um i think it's like other female role models like look at look at ellen DeGeneres. Mm. oh yes like she is she's been an overwhelmingly positive positive effect on the world that's her whole gig you know that's how she gained her celebrity you know through through just being a positive person who um, influences everyone around them in a positive way. So, um, to um, piggyback off of your point, what do we think is, for, for each one of the people at the table, what is a good female role model? What are the traits that that person has, in your opinion? Like, what are things that you look for in a female role model, or just role models in general? Well, for me, I think any role model with a male or female you have to be someone strong, someone who doesn't compromise their opinions because of uh, how, how they're viewed by people, someone who, who sticks by what they say, 
who inspires you to be a better version of yourself than you already are. Um, yeah, just, you know, just someone who makes you want to do something good in the world. Because I feel like in this world, we need, we need that. We, we need more positivity in the world. I mean, just based off our conversation here, we've, um, we've subconsciously brought up the point of how controversy sells. Because yeah. we're more like social media mm. just presents it to us like, oh, Kylie Jenner. Uh, is, is the baby really Travis Scott or whatever? Yeah. But they don't really bring up. Oh, Michelle Obama donated but, this much to you know. You, know mm-hmm. you see, so we really, as human beings, we need to we need to sit down and think about what's most important in life. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, and just you know, just be more positive. So someone who inspires you to be a better version of yourself than you already are. And people like James was saying. Uh, celebrities are under a microscope now because of social media and it's hard for you to be good all the time for someone like Michelle Obama I commend her because I haven't heard any scandals about Mm -hmm. Michelle Obama and it's very difficult when you've got that microscope because we're all prone to do bad things it's human nature we're we're all human so I feel like like Anna was saying you shouldn't um, shouldn't look at the negative aspects of, of uh, someone's life or what they do, but you should focus more on the positive and feed off that, feed off that. Yeah. And to yeah. add to that, um, definitely for me, uh, I feel that someone, a, a good role model for me is definitely someone who has the ability to inspire other people. Because I just feel like we all have different stories, we all have we all come from different experiences and to find that person that you feel that you can connect to and really just their story or whatever they've been through or whatever they're going through now or how um, they how much effort and work it took them to get where they are now it, that really stands out for me because I just um, in this world it's really difficult to find someone that you connect to because I mean it's there are a lot of people out there and to find that person who's going to keep you motivated, who's going to inspire you not to give up and keep pushing, doesn't matter your circumstances, doesn't matter what's happening, that, that really stands out for me. And I think to touch on everybody's point, maybe it's a personal thing because everybody is attracted to someone as a role model because they see something that they're inspired by. Mm-hmm. And so the last point that I want to bring up is an article that I read from Jezebel um, online, which says, it's a direct quote, one group of women's perfect role model is another group's about shit weirdos trying to pin what women do, famous or otherwise, into neat little boxes of appropriate use of their brains, talents, and bodies that would look like girls that would that are positive things for girls to emulate is unfair. Mm. So like trying to say, oh, this is a positive trait yeah. and this is a not, yeah. that's the, the point of the article. So I agree with that to some extent. I think that there are some things that, that people can do that are not positive, uh, both male and female. So I don't completely agree with that point. But I think it's interesting that maybe it is a, more of a personal choice. Yeah. Of course, there are people who inspire many people because they're so outstanding. But then some people may find some someone inspiring that another person doesn't. And one thing that I want to bring up, um, Ashley Graham, she's a uh, she's plus size model that have been out yeah. there, but they don't really get the same attention as you know the slim, yeah. trim, perfect model. And she's been one of the first people to get on magazine covers that's not a perfect model according to the world. But the thing that I like about it is that she went out there knowing that she's not the perfect model and she's just like, this is me, this is what I'm gonna do. And what I read, um, Summer Andrews, she's 18, she posted that if it doesn't get enough likes, I take it off. Uh, social media, Instagram, whatever. So if she posts a picture or selfie or anything and it doesn't get enough likes, for a minimum of enough likes is 140 likes on Instagram. So if a picture doesn't get there, she takes it off. And then I looked at Ashley Graham and I was just like, yes, yeah, she is. She advocates about um, being imperfect and still loving yourself. And this is where 
children like this, younger generation, need people like her to just don't deny who you are. Take yourself, embrace what you are. Because if you're not going to love yourself, who else is going to do it? You have to love yourself first before other people can get to love you. Mm -hmm. So that's just, people like this are really needed. And that's one point that really stood out for me. Yes. Um, when people are polled, who is your, you know, your number one female role model? 54% of people say their mom. Yeah, obviously, so yes. We're sort, of, we're, <laughs> we're sort of projecting this into like outer, like, yeah. as far as female, like as far exactly. as social media and people who they see as uh, role models from the exterior, you know. But the majority of people are influenced by people who are close to them. Okay. And female empowerment is on the rise. It may not feel that way because it's still so lopsided, but it is on the rise. So every single time that we see that, you know, there's a female CEO in the Fortune 500, that person automatically becomes a role model. There's more women uh, than ever uh, graduating from university and college. Each one of those individuals can be a role model. There's more women in science, more people in, more women in po politics. All of these people are potential role models. And that's bringing it into a like, smaller sphere, people that you're actually interacting with and are actually going to have a mentorship role in your life. For me, that's, that, those are true role models. Um, what you see and you want to emulate from the outside world is a different sphere. These people don't directly influence you as much as they create expectations. Okay, I think that was a really productive conversation about what it means to be a role model and also maybe the lens in which current society is presenting mm -hmm. the people that we find inspiring. Okay. Are tiny houses the sustainable solution to the world's housing crisis? This is our next topic. Recently, the UN has started a project that they're displaying in New York that shows the latest models of tiny houses. And we want to speak with our hosts about if the tiny house uh, movement is a good idea for the housing crisis or if they think it's impractical. Let's start the conversation. I think the, the first thing you gotta sort of set a baseline is like, where's the crisis? Are we talking about not enough space or are we talking about affordability? Well, there's many different things you could go off of because we're at a lack of material, we're running out of materials, then there's the eco-friendly portion of like that the, we're trying to build more sustainable homes that aren't gonna uh, create as many uh, emissions and things like that. So it could become that from many different angles. But there's the like if we're just taking from an American perspective, not where just an American the expectation is that you have this great big grand house and you know it's mostly uh, due to finances. People can't afford these right. things in the U.S. That's true. That's um, well around the world. I mean, we're looking at the U at the U.K. right now. They're looking at things like generational mortgages, mm -hmm. where you have to sign a contract where your kids are going to take on your mortgage. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the physical size of the home. It has to do with this affordability. And I think that actually goes back to how we leverage all of our eco economics on uh, real estate. Everything is leveraged on real estate. Yep. So making a house smaller, we're going from like a, what a, you know a Happy Meal down to a, you know, down where we're gonna Happy Meal our houses now. Just, Just the chicken nugget box. box. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna value <laughs> <laughs> value meal our houses now. Yes. Well, and the other thing that they're bringing up in this conversation, too, is that because in the U.S., because property value is so expensive, you can build a tiny home, but then to rent the space in the places where these tiny homes would be most efficient in cities where there's an overpopulation problem, it's astronomical to be able to rent the property. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the tiny home itself is less expensive, but, the but then the property to rent is the problem, and that's what makes them a little bit uh, not so viable for people, that, especially if they live in the city. Now, if they're living in the country, and the reason that they're doing it is to be more eco-friendly, then I think that the argument is that that may be a better way, a better use of the tiny home. Mm -hmm. But now, the tiny home is cheap. Like you just said, obviously. Yeah. But uh, I think the average it's, it's is 30,000 or something like that. They, in uh, the they said that it's uh, 15,000 15, to like 
fifty. Fifty, yeah, fifteen, fifteen. So my question is now: I get this cheap, uh, tiny house, yeah. but where am I going to place it? <laughs> right. Well, that's the problem. Because you give me a solution with well, another problem. Uh, actually, there is a, a way of working that out, and there are companies that are actually working on that, where they've created structures, like almost like shelving for tiny homes. So one of the big eco problems when it comes to housing is actually going from point A to point B to get to your work or where you need to get to. Mm -hmm. So if you can make these things portable, so you're not just moving your stuff, you're moving your whole home well, many of them into something, into a, into a structure that can be slotted into a specific spot. Mm -hmm. And then you're now you're closer to your, you're closer to your work, you're closer to the, all the amenities that you want to get to. Um, it'd be a lot cheaper and to be able to have one of these things and put it somewhere rather than trying to buy real estate going from one place to another. But my thing is, okay, so now it's going to be portable and if I have the opportunity to move closer to my workplace, I'm going to move to the build just like next to it. Absolutely. So the problem now is going to be that people will be moving to places where they're not supposed to be. How do you mean? Like for instance, um, you're gonna move, how How can I say it? So the country or the city where you are, or it's set out obviously in a certain way. So now there's place for housing, there is a specific place for shops, there's, specific, there's a specific place for everything. Mm -hmm. So are they gonna have a specific place for these um, tiny homes? where they're all going to have to be in a specific place or can people just move around with it? I think it would have to be a, a comply with zoning laws for that for that area. But that, that's all going to change. You know, this this sort of it adds another layer to flexibility when it comes to when it comes to urban home or urban housing. Um, if you take, let's say, in China where they have factories and right beside it, they've right. got dormitories, yeah, massive yeah. dormitories. Those places are tiny, tiny little shoe boxes that people live in, yeah. you know, and they work right next door. They don't leave a quarter kilometer of their, of their home. So I think maybe in the US, this might be a solution for one generation, where one generation might be able to afford their homes and be able to get ahead. But in the long run, it ca the economy is just gonna catch up with it, and even a tiny home is going to be worth as much as a regular home, mm -hmm. as far as your percentage is concerned. I mean, if you take Shanghai, which is the most one of the most populated cities in, in the world, um, forty six square meters, a forty six square meter condo is worth over a million U.S. dollars. So inflation is always going to catch up, based on based on population and demand. So. And the other thing that I was reading also is that, like. Um, the fabrication time for the homes is much faster, of course. So mm -hmm. it, the houses take about four weeks to fabricate and only two days to install. So for, I guess I'm speaking more about, uh, more broadly as far as like in the international community, that they are much easier to construct than um, like a traditional home. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that there are a lot of um, new advancements with even um, the possibility of being able to 3D print homes which would be um, really, you know, quick because they can 3D print the pieces and you literally just snap them together. Yeah. They've also started to develop bricks that are made out of like recycled water bottles mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think that not only this tiny houses is one part of this um, proposed solution to uh, lower the effects of the housing um, housing on the environment, but there's also other things that are coming that we're thinking about, okay, how can we make this less impactful on the environment? Since this, uh, these tiny houses are affordable, is it, um, what about, how is the quality though? Like the quality of life? The quality of life. Your, like, has your livelihoods get affected? <laughs> from like, going from I mean, a mansion to a, to a shoebox? Because I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you're talking about how you're not house the poor, bricks probably. are made from recycled, <laughs> Whatever, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but say on stormy days, like how protected are 
the people that are living here. Structurally sound. Well, I guess yes. if it's between that and living just in a tent, you know, which is some, to some people that's the option. Yeah. Out of your car. You know, especially yeah. with people who are migrating to different places, they literally have no place that they can go. Mm -hmm. And so it, this is better than the alternative for many people, I think. Because what I'm thinking now is, on long run, is this gonna be, is it gonna get expensive or not? Because if I have to think about the materials you just mentioned and um, you live in a country that's probably, it rains a lot, uh, stormy winds and stuff like that, um, will I have to do repair and maintenance mm. often? That's what I'm thinking about. So it's cheap for the moment, but on the long run, is it gonna cost me more than I expected it to be? Exactly. Cheap can be expensive in many <laughs> cases. <laughs> that's, that, that's the truth. That's the truth. Because, uh, I mean, just thinking back to a few weeks ago, uh, my earphones broke. Simple <laughs> example. My yeah. earphones broke, and um, I got some for 99 baht because, you know, they're cheaper. Right than what I usually buy. I got them and, they broke. and no, they didn't break. <laughs> they were just way too loud. And then I ended up having to buy just the regular earphones that I always get. So cheap is expensive. They need, there needs to be, I mean, the, the heads of government need to sit down and do proper urban planning and see the different, the different uh, solutions they can come up with. Uh, to solve this housing crisis, mm. not necessarily, you know, building tiny homes. I mean, I don't want, I don't want people to come to my house and be like, oh, I 3D printed it like three years ago. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. yeah, so they, I feel like, yeah, it, in my opinion, I don't think that uh, tiny mm. homes mm. are the solution to, to um, the housing problem. I just feel like there, there needs to be, you know, uh, more urban planning and, you know, just different solutions that people can come up with mm. to, to combat this issue. Because, my what I'm also thinking about now, what is the real problem? Why should there be tiny homes? Because exactly. um, it's, uh, land is expensive. Mm -hmm. So, why aren't we focusing on that part of trying to find a solution? Yes, there is a solution with tiny homes, but why are we going to tiny homes? Because there is this problem that has not been solved yet. So maybe if that can be solved, then we can move on to tiny homes. That's just how I'm viewing this now. And I feel like just simply thinking, um, if you look at Bangkok, there are millions and millions of people in Bangkok oh, because you know it's, uh, it's the primary city. Like there's a lot of, most of the business uh, that happens in Thailand, that happens in Bangkok. So I feel like even though it's, it's not such an easy answer to give, I feel like if, um, if businesses were to set up shop elsewhere in other not so densely located yeah. areas, then that could help because you know, you would be able to, to plan uh, the housing structures better around those areas. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not it's not as simple. Otherwise, maybe they, they would have done it already. But yeah, that's that's just an idea of you know businesses expanding outside these you know these primate cities. Yeah, so that there wouldn't be as much of a need for people to come from all over all over uh, the country to come to those places and live in tiny homes. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, because a lot of the uh, problem is that it's in some, where all of our economies are put into really small well, areas. Yeah, you see, you see. Yeah. So the last thing that I want to um, bring up is just like a, a percentage and a fact about how the housing sector contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. The housing sector uses 40% of the planet's total resources and represents over one third of greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's really important that we're talking about this issue and also like the possible other uh, things that we can do to minimize that because it's a huge portion of the the contribution and to it emissions. And it also feels a problem in every country. Right. This is a heating and air conditioning is where a lot of that what a lot of that cost comes in. Like when we're talking about greenhouse gases, yeah, um, it's the energy after the fact, and the smaller the smaller space that you're inhabiting, the the less that you're going to you're going to be pouring those resources in, like causing that type of pollution. Mm -hmm.